Merci. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Uh, je m'excuse, je ne parle plus de français. So I'll talk in English because that's better for everyone, I think. Um, so I want to talk about adhesion playing a role in crumpling uh, today. Um, but before I do, I'll do the obligatory introduction. I'm sure you all know why we're interested in, in thin objects these days. Um, this is kind of some pragmatic examples of why you'd want something thin, because you can make it conformal, uh, because when you're thin, it's very easy to bend, right? And this leads to some interesting structure formation, like these wrinkles and things like this, but also hopefully useful technologies like solar cells you can just roll out when you feel like charging your phone or something like this. Um, other things that you might be able to exploit with thin objects is sort of ideas from origami. And so you can get more complicated mechanical structures um, because you can use some different kinds of rules. So here we see an object that's bi-stable. So this is a stint. It's stable in a closed configuration. You can put it into a blood vessel and then you can pop it open and snap it into a second stable state. And that's uh, something that's kind of an interesting behavior that you get um, just by putting these thin pieces together in the right patterns. Okay, and again, folding things up so you can take them out later when you need them is of course an obvious example. And so this is just a very nice high-tech example of how you'd fold up a, a solar cell so you could put it in your rocket and take it to space and open it up when you need the surface area. Um, are any of you familiar with this guy? Okay. This, this is beautiful. This is an origami rabbit, of course. Um, but it's created by software by this guy who is an undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo when he started doing this in collaboration with Eric at uh, MIT. But he took a software that can take any solid object and scan it and then predict an origami pattern onto a sheet of paper that you can fold up and make that. And that's some of the beauty of origami is that you can really build any structure you want from these simple rules of where to put folds and things in your paper. Now, I have no idea how long it took to actually fold this or how possible that is or what kind of skills you need to be able to do that, but it is possible, okay? Um, the origami we do is much simpler, right? So very repeatable patterns and things like this. And there's a lot of fun things uh, you can do with these, like they have complicated mechanical behavior that's a little hard to predict ahead of time. So this structure, which I, I didn't have time to fold on this trip, and unfortunately I forgot my travel origamis uh, somewhere. But again, this is a mirror or a pattern. I'm sure you've seen it. When you pull on it, it expands in all these different directions, and it has some fun things when you put moments on it. Uh, you can sort of make it into a little gripper motion uh, if you apply moments in the right place. And then there's more complicated patterns you can do. Of course, the sky's the limit. This is a Ron Resch pattern. He was an artist, and he was interested in crumpling, uh, not because of the mechanics, but because of the beauty in these uh, random structures. And he actually pulled out things like this, where this is a set of triangles, and you get them to fold in and hide, and you get a new surface that's kind of flat. So we're interested in, in playing with that a little bit. Um, but because I'm a terrible artist, most of my origami ends up like this. Um, so this is really what I want to talk about today. So again, if you've never had a, a terrible day that's ended in a rejection or something, then maybe you've never made one. So I'll pass around an example material for you to play with if you don't feel like listening. Um, th these are fascinating structures um, because they kind of represent a new class of material that's completely underused in the outside world. So if you think about this, this is a very stiff structure. I already can't collapse it, but it, it is also very light. So I in a lot of ways, it's very similar to something like a foam, but you can easily create it out of a sheet of paper. You don't need some complicated system for putting in air bubbles and things like this. Um, it's very, very easy to play with. Um, so we're kind of interested I in maybe that pragmatic angle that if you could supply engineers with structure property relationships for a material like this, then maybe it could fill a useful niche out in the real world, okay? So that, that's kind of the goal is to be able to predict how much force it takes to crush something like this um, as we go. Now, the hope there is for a physicist to being able to do something like that for something as completely complex and mixed up as this crumpled ball is that there's some hope that it's only built of a handful of smaller structures. And again, as a physicist, we're kind of reductionists, so we like the idea that if you understand the little bits, then hopefully you can build the big picture, right? Um, so bending, I've already mentioned, is of course important. 
And you can also take those bends and you can drive them down to the smallest dimension available, just the, the dimensions of the sheet, okay? Now, this often leads to plastic damage, as in paper, okay, and you actually get these things stuck. So this is something you would call a fold, okay? Um, but it definitely means that you've done plastic damage at this point, and so that's got to be important to how it works. Uh, the less obvious structures occur when you take a bent sheet and try and bend it orthogonally to the first direction. This is where you create point defects known as developable cones, right? So we have kind of a cone shape there. And what's happening here is, again, to, to bend the second direction, it requires the sheet to stretch, and the street doesn't want to stretch because it's so stiff, and so it, it localizes it to a point defect. So all your stretching is somewhere in this tiny region around the tip, and everywhere else is unstretched, okay? Now that's fine until you're faced with trying to do that twice, and that's where you get into bigger problems. So I've cheated and made this one already, but... Um, there we go. Oh. I'm forming one where I don't want one. That's always the problem. Anyway, um, when you have two cones, as I've made here, they need to be connected through a new structure known as a stretching ridge. Okay, and again, the issue here is that when I've localized to one spot here and I've localized to one spot there, they both want to form a cone shape, but that those two cones have to meet somehow and that causes additional stretching in the sheet that it can't push into the cone tips. And so it spreads the stretching out much further. And again, if you took a structure like this and pushed on the ends, you can feel it's fairly stiff already, okay? And so there's several ideas out there about how to build a crumple out of these things. Of course, one focuses on structures like that and the other focuses on structures like this, okay? So I want to talk a little bit about that if I get to it today. So. This is the basic outline of the talk. You know, can we understand these at all based on little bits? Um, if we can, can we learn anything about other physics that's going on inside these things as we go? Okay. Uh, now, I'm an experimentalist, so I'm going to put up a full-on experimental slide where I talk about different real materials we use and things like this. So if you're not into that, go ahead and uh, think about something else for a minute. Um, but the materials are really important, as we'll see, that if you choose different materials, you get very different outcomes, even though you may not notice it from the kinds of things that you measure in these experiments, okay? So the first one we want to use is a, a rubber. It's PDMS, it's Silgard. Everybody uses this rubber. It's all over the place. And the idea there is that we'd like to hope that elasticity is working in these systems. So we'd like to have a material we can reliably say is an elastic material, okay? Now, there's caveats with all this stuff, right, that this is really a nonlinear rubber at any appreciable strain, and there's, there's other issues there as well. Um, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about polystyrene, but more about polycarbonate. So polycarbonate's a very nice, rigid polymer. Again, it's used for a lot of protective equipment because it has a very high degree of plasticity, so it yields a long way before it actually breaks. Polystyrene is pretty fragile, so it'll crack right through when you do something to it. Um, so three different materials, three different behaviors at strain, and we can create them over a huge range of different thicknesses, okay? And that's going to be very useful when we try and figure out what's going on. Um, and then our main tool is the confocal microscope. So we can embed these things in an index-matched fluid, and then you can watch the entire structure as you crush it, okay? And from that, uh, we can learn a few things that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Um, so simple pieces are a good place to start because hopefully you'll agree that even an experimentalist like me can understand something as simple as a single bent sheet, okay? So that's where I'm going to start, so at least you believe I know something, okay? So here we have our sheet. It's made into a, a simple bend like that. All there is there is curvature of some radius r. Again, we've separated our two parallel plates by some distance, and we're applying a load, right? Over here, we see the confocal microscope picture. Again, we see it's bent, right? Not a surprise. We can go through the experiment. We can take pictures the whole time, but skipping some details, you end up with a higher curvature after you compress it, right? And this is the kind of mechanics uh, that hopefully every undergrad can do. You can work out a very simple relationship between the force, the sort of out-of-page out of dimension of the film, and its bending modulus, okay? So, uh, this is good because the bending modulus contains 
the basic information about the materials. And like I said, we're going to treat some different materials, so it's at least important to know the mechanics of those materials independently before we start. So you can think about this as just an experiment that's going to allow us to measure the bending modulus of these different materials. And what you can do with that is you can make a whole bunch of different thicknesses, right? And then you can plot your bending modulus versus your thickness, and you should be able to get Young's modulus out. Okay, so how well does it work? Well, here's some data from PDMS, and you can see both in compression and pulling out, we're not seeing a lot of loss. It's a very beautiful fit to the simple idea. And so you can repeat that a whole bunch of times, and again, with a whole bunch of different thicknesses, and you can find your slope and measure the moduli. That's nice. You know, this is simple enough to understand. We can measure the modulus of PDMS in a hundred different, more standard ways, and again, we get perfect agreement, so that's nice. Okay. Again, polycarbonate is three orders of magnitude bigger, just like you'd expect uh, from reading the label on the box. What's fun, though, is there's other details that come up as soon as you start doing something this simple. And one of the things you'll see is if you take a PDMS film and you make it fairly thin and you make it fairly wide so that dimension out of the page is big, you'll start seeing things like this, that now I do see separation between my indentation and my pulling off curve, right? So of the students, does anybody know what that means? It's very simple. There's not a lot here. This force is negative, right? It's sticking to the glass. So when I pull out, I have to peel it off. So really, on top of the mechanics, we have a double peel test here, which is really nice if you want to do adhesion, OK? Um, but again, you know, I'll, I'll skip the details. It's not too hard to make the changes. And again, if you fit the asymptotic part of the curve, you get your work of adhesion, which is, again, your standard sort of material property of the adhesion problem out. So in this case, it's between glass and the PDMS film, because we use glass walls. But again, we could put PDMS on the walls and then do a pure PDMS adhesion measurement as well. Uh, what's fun, and I think I took the slide out for the sake of time, is that you can repeat it with a polycarbonate too. And of course, you'd say, well, polycarbonate doesn't stick to anything, right? It's hard. Well, that's not true if it's very, very thin. Okay, so once you start getting below a micron or so, your polycarbonate is going to be flexible enough to have good surface contact, even with rough glass and you're going to measure a hysteresis there too for the same reason. So again, it's good to do stuff like that because sometimes you may have overlooked these details that may be important later, okay? Uh, one of the other things you can do is, of course, recognize that, yeah, modulus is really not a static thing, especially for polymer glasses and things like this. And so, again, you may want to watch this as a function of time to see what kind of dynamics you have in the material. So, we more or less run quasi-statically. Our confocal isn't a, a pinwheel one, so it doesn't go very fast. So that's part of the reason. Um, but we can definitely do sort of force recovery experiments. So you take your film and you squeeze it, and then you just hold right there and watch the force as a function of time. And you can get sort of the long time dynamics of your material out, OK? So again, how does it look? So here's just PDMS and polycarbonate. And they look like they're pretty good logarithmic curves. So for the sake of going into the details of the materials, we'll just fit with a logarithm that has sort of a, a single force constant like that. Okay? And again, we can do a lot of different film thicknesses. It's a tough measurement because, again, you've got to leave it in the lab for hours and hours. So it is a bit noisy. But on top of that, I've plotted a square root power law here. And again, without going into the material details, that's kind of what you would expect for aging on these time scales. It's just diffusive. So you just have little voids that slowly percolate away until they leave the system at its walls, okay? And so that's why it's dependent on thickness. If you're thin, it takes a lot less time to randomly walk your way out of the system, okay? So there's nothing new here. All of this stuff is well known. Um, but again, it's good to be able to do it exactly with your materials before you start anything more complicated. Um, so here's the real experiment, right? Let's put our crumple in our cell, and then we'll just apply our forces and do the same thing. Okay, so here's what it looks like um, from the microscope. So this is several large field scans glued together. And for the sake of time, we'll just focus on one little region. Where is it? Right there. And we'll look at that in three dimensions as we go. So maybe it's not turning out so great there. Um, but you can see a lot of things going on. This is a PDMS film. You can see a lot of bends. You can see how it contacts other places in the system. And again, you can watch that as you go, as you go right? And so. In a region like this, you can see we're developing a lot more contact between sheets as we go. We can see our curvatures are getting higher in places and things like that. This is all kind of stuff you'd expect to happen when you compress this thing further. Um, but it is important to notice it, okay? 
And so what's the outcome? Well, here's the answer, right? So polycarbonate, which is a plastic material, looks something like this on compression. And then on the way out, we drop to zero very quickly and pull off. And this is what you'd expect from paper, right? You invest energy, you can feel it as you're crushing it up, but then when you take your hands off, it doesn't spring back into a flat sheet, right? So there's a lot of loss, and that's again your area under the curve, right? But it should be obvious that plasticity is an important part of how that thing works because you've, you've lost a lot of energy. Now the PDMS, on the other hand, it's elastic, right? So we should expect no hysteresis because it's an elastic material, right? Well, that's what you get with PDMS, okay? So again, we've started a little higher because again, we've got to squeeze it and fit it in the cell before we start. Um, but you can see there's definitely hysteresis there on the way out. This one? We start here, we go up to high force, and we come back down, yeah. This, uh, the problem with the rubbers is they, they do unfurl to some degree. So if, if you fold one up, you don't get it in the cell in the right density. So you've kind of got to hold it and start somewhere. Yes, but it, the force is always positive here. It doesn't actually drop to negative. So there's a lot of elastic energy, so you don't feel it pulling on the cell. We're, we're doing that with a different material now. Um, but that's the idea. Again, you've got to put it in a little bit up there. Now, what's happening there is adhesion. And I'm going to skip to the answer, so there's no surprises. Okay, And we know that for a lot of different reasons. One of them is, as you're watching that structure collapse, one of the physical changes is that a lot of sheets are coming into contact. And there has to be an energy accounting of that. Uh, the other way we can do it, which is much more simpler, is just take adhesion away, right? So what we do is we take that same PDMS film. So this green is the exact film we did the blue experiment with. We take it and we coat its surface with powder. Okay, and again with the confocal you can see that you only have a single layer of powder so we're not talking about grains rolling or anything like this. The powder, powder sticks to the rubber but then it keeps films from contacting elsewhere. Okay, and when you take away the surface then you have again a really nice low hysteresis kind of curve. Okay, so that's one of the ways we can take away adhesion. Again, we've done this in a number of different ways. The most careful way we did is we used uh, polystyrene colloids and put a monolayer on, and it was beautiful. Again, it was sparse, so the, the colloids weren't hitting each other when you move. Um, but that was very expensive, so most of this data is with cornstarch, which is you know, fairly cheap um, to use. Uh, but we noticed no difference. Now, to understand what's going on there, again, we can see all of those have a kind of upward moving slope. They all are well fit to power laws, which is kind of what a lot of people want uh, to use because they're easy and uh, hopefully we could get a scaling model that would help us out from these small structures, right? So there's, there's two existing models. The first is the oldest um, by the Chicago group and there they focus on these stretching ridges and say the stretching ridge is the important part in this structure. So how many stretching ridges per volume do you have you know, and that allows us to predict the scaling. A and the second model, of course, uh, you may know here, is similar in that it focuses on one of these small structures, but in this case, everything is plastically deformed down to a small size, and then we look at how many of those folds we have to build up our structure. Um, I'm sorry to say I don't agree with either of those um, at this point, but I don't have a better theory uh, either. Okay, so how does this work? Well, here's our bending ridge. Okay, so again, if I connected a straight line between the D cones, that would be unstretched, but because I've deformed that straight line down, I have some stretching in there. So if we could estimate the scale of that, and I'll just kind of skip through that, you can write down a strain. Okay, so the strain should scale like that. Again, it should be related to um, the curvature in the ridge going sort of along this dotted line. So this dotted line is kind of a cutout that you see here. Um, and then with that, you can of course write down your bending energy and you can now write down your stretching energy because you've said how much strain you have stored there, okay? And so again, we can minimize that, it gets you your curvature at that point in the middle and then of course you can put it all back in, you can get the total energy, okay? Uh, what's more useful for us is looking at the force it would take to compress the ridge further, okay? So I can put that down there too, but it's all scaling so it's pretty, 
pretty straightforward. Um, then what you have to do is estimate, you know, how many of those ridges per volume you have, okay? And again, that requires you to do something like a, a density like this, which, you know, ideally would be the thickness of your sheet divided by the length of the ridges, okay? And again, assuming we have sort of a cylindrical shape when we're compressing our crumple, you can do a bit of geometry and you can kind of write that down like this as well, okay? So again, what's that mean? Well, ultimately it means the total energy of the crumple is going to be this big thing, so your modulus is involved, the sheet thickness, the radius of that crumple, the size of the sheet, and of course the, the distance between your parallel plates. So everything you'd expect to be there is somewhere. Again, if we switch to forces, which I'll do, we could focus on this, okay? So if this theory works, it's predicting we should have minus eight-thirds power to our power law, okay? So again, like I said, we can fit the data to power laws, so let's just use a generic power law, because it's easier to talk about. So I'll just fit some amplitude of the power law to the plate separation and then some arbitrary power and see how well that does. So for the rubber, the power we get, as other people have seen, is, is fairly close. It's not too bad, right? And the error is not too bad. It's not great, um, but these are real experiments, so it's not bad. So you might be hopeful that this is a good theory and it's working out. The problem is when we switch to the other material, well, that power is well outside what's predicted, but the error is also as big as the number, which is also not a good sign, okay? So that's not so good. Uh, but maybe it works for the elastic system, which would be the intent, right? Because that's, that's the one that stretches. Um, mm -hmm. Many experiments, many experiments, different thickness, different size, yeah. And that's the average. Right. It, it's very close to a straight line, so you would believe it's a power law with an error by looking at it. But again, I mean, to get many orders of magnitude, you'd have to somehow switch force transducers a whole bunch of times in your experiment, and so that's a clear limitation to, to doing things with a power law. Again, I mean, look at, look at this one here. I mean, it doesn't have a huge range there, right? And again, we, we can compress that further on this one, so we have other ones where we've gone further and shorter, and we've seen no pattern in how it fits, but it is all over the place. We do get a lot of power laws, okay? But there's a whole bunch more information in here. There's all this stuff out here that I've just stuffed into the amplitude, right? So this is another good thing to do. We can look at that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this amplitude and plot it against all of the rest of this stuff. So we should have a linear correlation if the model is right, and we should have something else if the model's wrong, okay? So I'm going to do that. So here's our measured amplitude, and here's all this other stuff except the modulus. So this is a correlation plot, but the slope of it is going to be the modulus of the material, which we already know, right? So it's a good way of checking. So up here in blue, we see the PDMS experiment. And, you know, it's, it's plausibly fitting a linear correlation there, until you look at the details, right? And it's telling you you've made terapascal rubber in your lab, which would be great. I mean, there would be a lot of applications of that, but we already know that's not true because we measured it when it was just a bend, right? So something is off there. You know, even for a scaling model, being off by that many orders of magnitude is not a good sign. Um, the polycarbonate's the red, though, and so... Sorry, is there any biologists here? No, so even in biology, that would be hard to call a correlation, right? Um, so, we think that's a good sign that this may not be working, right? Um, right. You could call it an effective thing. Right, you could call it an effective thing if you wanted, but that means you believe this model is correct, right? And so, again, I don't really care about characterizing it right now. I want to know if the model's correct, right? And so I'm using that as a sign that this can't be the right modulus. It has to be some other effective step that goes into that ridge. Right, this is supposed to be the one of the ridge. So there's something else effective that would have to go into just the ridge part before you moved on to anything more complicated. And I'm going to come back to the ridges at the end if I have any time. Um, because again, that, 
for a model like this, that's where you should start. You should start with a small piece and make sure it's working. Um, but anyway, uh, so there we go. So now we have the other model. Okay, so here the idea is the energy is stored in a fold. So that basically means the bending of these very sharp places, right? So again, you can write the bending energy down and it should scale like uh, the thickness of your film, right? And you should end up with basically the energy per fold of something like this, okay? Um, again, as things get harder, so once I've folded a film once, I have a nice thick ridge, but if I fold it again this way, well, now I'm folding twice as much paper and it gets harder and harder, as, as I'm sure we know. Um, again, you could do it different ways and fold it, you know, maybe this way the second time and things like that. And so the beauty of this model is it predicts a range of exponents that could come out that's based on kind of the geometry of how you end up packing those things in there. And that, I think, is important, okay? Again, if we wrote it down in terms of a force, we would predict it to scale something like this. So here is our sheet size and here is our separation between the walls. Again, it's a negative power law but they predict a range this time of one to four. So we've already seen the PDMS falls into that range. So again, that's a good sign for this model, but we've already seen that the polycarbonate doesn't fit into that range, right? And of the two materials, the polycarbonate is the one that's more plastic and maybe the one that fits better into the idea of how that model comes. Now, again, we can go to the amplitude part and fit all that other stuff. So in this case, it's thickness squared to times the sheet size to the power of alpha, where alpha is this measured power law that you need uh, to get the units right. Again, plotted in this way, the slope of the linear correlation should be your modulus, okay? And so, again, it looks really good. So this model is really close, um, but again, when we fit it, now we're going the wrong direction in that our polycarbonate has, uh, you know, seven megapascal modulus. So the first model is wrong this way, and this model seems to be wrong the other way, although it does look much better. So the data is looking much more linear here. So again, we don't think this quite works. There's other reasons to believe this isn't working too. So again, PDMS is where it's in the exponent range that's predicted, and so it's possible that's doing things uh, the way that's intended. But we look inside those structures, and we see that there is no or very few perfectly collapsed ridges in there. So very little of the structure is actually a fold, right? So something's very close, but not quite uh, matching our materials. Um, so at, at this point, we're stuck, and we have to do something empirical, which is, again, terrible, I realize. Uh, but if we make a small change to that second model, in that we scale everything by the size of the crumpled ball rather than the size of the sheet of the paper, which does makes a little bit more sense, uh, we would predict a power law like this. And before I, I go into checking that, I want to say that by making this change, though, we don't really feel like we're following uh, the model in the way that it was derived. So really, even though it's close, I think you should take this as purely an empirical thing with no basis on fact or smaller structures at this point, okay? Now, why I like that is because it works very well. So if we look at the non-adhesive PDMS plotted again in this way, sorry, that should be F0. This is our amplitude versus what we predict in the rule. We get a very nice linear correlation, okay? And again, we get the modulus almost exactly right, okay? So that, that's a good sign that at least this empirical rule we can hand off to the engineering community and say, if you make a thing like this, this is how much force it's going to hold up, okay? So that's nice. Again, we can push that further by looking at small changes in the system. So first I'll just show the adhesive PDMS, and there you can see the structure's strength jumps up. So in this case, we would call this an effective modulus of the structure, right? And in this case, we've got you know, an order of magnitude increase because it's a little bit sticky. Now, if you've worked with PDMS, you notice it's a rubber, it sticks a little bit, but this is 10 to 1, so I it's not super sticky. You don't feel your finger sticking to it and pulling off. Um, you notice that it might stick to a piece of glass and you have to peel it off. So it's not a good adhesive. And so if you wanted to engineer stronger structures out of the same stuff, you could use more traditional adhesive treatments. And we're playing around with this a little bit now. Um, but just imagine taking double-sided tape and crushing that up. Again, it sticks to itself very well, and so you end up with a much stronger structure in the end uh, than you would have otherwise. 
Now we also have the polycarbonate. And so again, we can plot that up here and there's a bit more noise, but it's reasonably following the power law. Okay, and what's fun there is we can separate the polycarbonate into thick polycarbonate and thin polycarbonate. And again, the thin polycarbonate is always lying on the upper part of the scatter. So again, now that we've seen what adhesion is doing, we can see where some noise comes into a material we may have ignored that from before, because again, it's pushing the modulus up, the thinner it gets and the more it sticks to itself. Okay. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's not bad, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's not bad. Um, again, empirical, but useful, we hope. And hopefully, because again, we found where some of these other things come into data, that maybe we can refine this and use it to better understand mechanically why this, this seems to be a good prediction, okay? Now, of course, we talked about other features in um, these mechanical properties. And so I just want to show the dynamic side of things right now, because if you have the modulus right in this little empirical model, then that should be the same dynamics as well, because you should be isolating the exact same piece, right? So what we can do is we can go and do our force recovery experiments. So we've got a little transient at the startup, but then you see for polycarbonate and non-adhesive PDMS, you get these nice logarithmic trends, okay? Which is again, exactly what we saw for the materials by themselves. The sticky stuff, though, does something very different. So it, it tries to be logarithmic, but then it kind of starts falling off at some point. Okay, so its dynamics are worse. But again, they should be because there's more physics there, and adhesion is a dynamic process a lot of the time as well. Um, what's interesting is that this fits kind of a stretched exponential shape if you felt like it, which is something people see a lot in the crumpling uh, world. Okay, so maybe that's uh, a piece of the confusion. But again, if we fit those time constants over top of the old ones, so the simple bends are the open signal sing symbols and the solid ones are our crumples, again, you see it's exactly where it was before. So again, we're fairly certain we're isolating at least the modulus out, out of this empirical law um, fairly reliably. So hopefully useful. Okay. Right. But back to theory. How long have I been talking? Do I have a bit of time left? Because I, I could go faster here if I, I have some time. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is a fun part. This is stuff we've been working on lately. So we go back to the theory and we say, okay, you know, why didn't this work? Because that, I mean, it's a pretty good idea. All these ideas are pretty good. Um, so where did they go to? Um, basically, if we remember the ridge, we had this geometric prediction that came in due to the curvature there. And so that's something we could look for. And we could also go back to looking at the forces directly, right? So if we have a single ridge, this was the building block prediction. So we should be able to see that for a single ridge if it's anywhere close, right? So here's an experiment with a PDMS ridge. Okay, so it, it's a bit choppy um, because to do the high resolution, we have to stitch a whole bunch of pictures together. Um, so we don't do as many time steps. Mm -hmm. We take it, we fold it twice so you get the ridge, and then our parallel plates are here, and we squish. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, no, this is a top down picture. Yeah. 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 So if I, I wonder if I can pause this. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So this is a D cone here. And this is the other one here, right? And so the axis is tilted a little bit on this one. Um, but again, you can see how that moves smoothly as we push this structure together. And that is basically what you'd predict. The forces, you get, you know, something that again is reasonably, believably assumed to be a power law. Um, and so again, we can fit sort of a generic thing there to test uh, out the power law. And here we get a set of exponents like this, where the exponent may be close to what was predicted, but you know th the error in that exponent is as large as it. So again, that's not a really reliable sign that this is making sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many many runs of different films, uh, different sizes, different shapes, all this other stuff. So we're hoping we'll be able to figure this out at some point. It's kind of ongoing right now, so we don't have a real answer. 
Um, but we have all the geometry, which is a starting point, right? And that's the beauty of doing things with the confocal, is we can go in and walk along sort of the peak curvature axes along the backbone and see what's going on there. So this would be the height as we walk along that thing S. And of course, you can get your curvatures in, in both directions. So you could write down a mean curvature that would look something like that, or a Gaussian curvature that looks something like that. So that's nice, because we have all the geometry. And that's all the model is based on, is the geometry. So we should be able to check um, some of the details there. And again, we can check it during the whole compression. So this is the ridge as it continues to get squished. Again, our curvature in the middle is going up, just like the model predicts. And again, you, if you like the Gaussian curvature, it's like that, and the mean curvature is like that. It's, it's pretty much what you'd expect from the model. So one way of looking at that is, say, plotting the curvature versus the prediction. And again, we get a perfect linear correlation there. So that's nice. That means the geometry is exactly like people expect it. But the force is not. So there's other details that are going on there. And I think it's important to point out that what this means is even in a ridge structure, the ridge is not the dominant part of that structure. There's a lot of other bending that's going on. I've, I've totally destroyed mine now. But there's a lot of other bending going on that's playing a role. Okay, so that original theory, if you were careful, you would have noted that one of the limits they chose to work in is a very high Fuppel von Karman number limit where bending is essentially zero cost, right? And so it's easy to lose track of the other bending in the problem because in terms of that place in the space of thickness and modulus and so on, it's okay. But the real structures are always very far away from that. And so that might be the biggest problem with trying to interpret things this way is that we're just not writing down the energies right because we're ignoring a lot of stuff. And so we're making some progress from that point of view. The other thing you might do is uh, more carefully look at what's going on. And of course, you can see some fun things here. So this is a snapping that happens. So you can see this one has tilted, and it stayed tilted. And at some point, it snaps, right? And so that's a real part of what goes on in real structures that, again, is totally ignored, right? So again, uh, some people in acoustics have listened to these structures. And you do see your pops and things like this going on. and so. Maybe snap through is part of the cause of that. So again, I, I, I'm not going to go into those details today. Uh, the details I do want is to go to the other materials. So polycarbonate being glassy and rigid, and we can push the thickness down and still work with it a lot more. You can hope to get this into the right range of von Karman numbers that uh, would actually be applicable with the theory. Okay, And so we're close. We're not quite there yet. We need a couple more orders, but uh, we'll get there eventually. But this is the kind of thing you see with the polycarbonate, is that this structure has just gotten crushed, right? So it's not moving smoothly at all. It's done what my little demo one has done. It's just completely crushed itself, right? So you end up with a crumple from the ridge that you were trying to use to understand the crumple. So it, it becomes a really problematic feedback. Um, the data of course, gets really rough as you're crushing it. And again, you can see there's hysteresis, so there's a tons of loss. Um, you know that's got to be important to what's going on, right? Well, what can we do? Well, we can do the experiment much more slowly, OK? And hopefully avoid the place where there's plastic damage when we're trying to check out the model. So if we just look at a part like that, where's? Oh, sorry, I moved it first. Uh, if we just look at the first part here, then hopefully that's the power law we were looking for. And we can use that to test the basic part of the theory. Now, you can see this one failed by buckling, which is kind of nice. So you have a cylindrical shape. And if the corner doesn't fail first, then what you get is a nice Euler buckling in the middle of your structure. right? And so we can play around with that a little bit. But for now, let's ignore it. It's all lost in this stuff over here. Um, but again, if we, if we do this, we see that it's equally terrible. right? So we think that the basic idea is the same in the polycarbonate. It's the same with the higher von Karman numbers uh, as it is in the lower von Karman number rubber ones. Again, we can go and check the geometry on these ones and make sure it's playing along too. So again, if we walk along there, we see very similar shapes and very similar curvatures, although a little bit higher because this is much thinner. Okay, And again, as we crush it, that's where we start to see differences. So in this one, 
we see sort of the first run in black spots, the second run in green spots, the third run in blue spots. So this is different stages of compression, and you can see nothing has changed in the geometry, right? And then eventually it buckles, and of course your Gaussian curvature flops to the other sign, okay? But this is the main thing of importance here, is that the geometry does not change until it fails. Right, so the the amount of extra strain you're building into that ridge is very tiny. It's not enough to even notice the ends have moved until it fails. Okay, and so again, that's an important part of the story. We can plot that on the same thing to look again at the amplitude versus the the basic geometric prediction. And again, in those polycarbonate structures, it's saying the geometry is exactly the same as the other ones. It's just higher modulus. Everything is the same. It's just not free to move. Right, and so if you remember to the steps of the model, it was write down the geometry to get your strains and then look at a variation in energy to find the minimum energy. Well, that's the basic problem here is that there's no variation allowed in the structure. So you can't possibly predict the answer from a variational step in uh, the model, okay? So again, we're stuck with these ones as well and aren't able to prove that the theory is working. Although at least the geometry is right, so that's good. So what do we do? Well, we'll do something empirical and terrible again, right? And we're going to try and take that data and fit it on top of the crumple data using the prediction that we had for the crumple. So this is the exact same scaling we had for the crumple, except the radius of the crumple is replaced with the length of the ridge. And when we do that, it falls exactly on top of the other data, okay? So again, we're looking for a modulus there. But I think this is a useful stage in that whatever the small structure is doing does indeed seem to be what the big structure is doing. Okay, so maybe there is some way of scaling that up. Um, but uh, that's sort of where we're stuck for now. So with that, I think I'll finish talking. It's getting warm anyhow. <laughs> and I'd be happy to have any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, there's a lot of more advanced theory that may be up here for me. Um, but uh, again, there's a lot of statistical theories where they've looked at the distribution of ridges and things like this. And this is probably an important part of a more realistic model, right? Um, but again, scaling should allow you to get away with some pushing of this to an average size, possibly. <laughs> but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're working on that. Um, where's a good picture? Yeah, maybe there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the thing is with this, we're not talking about creating the ridge. So we create the ridge and we make these decones and there's a lot of energy lost there. But then if it's elastic, moving that decone shouldn't matter. If it's plastic, it clearly does. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's right. That's one of the things we're thinking about. So even in the rubber, where you say, okay, it's elastic, so it's free to move because there's no energy change. Well, it's it's very very strained there, and if you look inside the D cone, you can see a lot of nonlinear elastic things like the what do you call it when you bend a rubber this way and you get the the invaginations in there. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Exactly. I, I think that's a lot of the problem. And we're trying to get a better experiment on that looking at this. So again, if you can write down the energy of your D cones and it's purely elastic, then you should be able to predict when they snap based on that energy and the rest of the structure. So we're trying that, but we're not there yet. No, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. There, there is energy loss in those cones, and that's why it's stable in the first place. Because again, if, if you look at where the boundaries are, you have these two D cones like this. Well, why don't they know about each other? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I don't know if I want to answer that. Um, we ha when you do the experiment over again with the same piece of rubber, it doesn't go to the same places and start in the same ways. Um, so it's not strong. But sometimes on the thick ones, you can see traces of where it's done. What's it? The bio instability, I think. Um, you can see traces of those things that are still there after. So is it is it just pushing some of the, you know, sort of the schmutz of the rubber? to different places, or is it a serious problem where you've started to fail there? I don't know. So I don't want to answer that yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And and this the the surprising thing is that the elastic thing turns out to be so similar to the one that's plastic in the end. And that's what concerns me a lot right now is because you guys with the folding model, I mean, that's very clear to show that it works great when you can do things that you can see, but in the crumple something gets lost somehow. I I, I don't know what. But that the plastic one looks exactly the same as the rubber one. Well, that's that's troubling because it shouldn't. I don't think unless it's all the bent parts that matter. And that's kind of how we're leaning, because these D cones get stuff stuck places and they cost more energy, but you have all this soft stuff, and that does a lot of the moving. So we're kind of wondering more if that's why your scaling's close, because it's just the bending energy that you have in there anyway. I, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you.